let um, each of our panelists introduce ourselves and um, to discuss the courses that they are either teaching or taking um, that touch on historical or contemporary issues of race. So Shamika, why don't we start with you and then we'll go to Kim and Kenoshi and then, then hopefully maybe Jonathan will be with us. Um, hi everybody, my name is Shamika Johnson. I am currently an FIT undergrad student in the Art History and Museum Professions Program, um, as well as a writer and curator outside of school. But during my time in school, I have created a platform called Art on the Ground, which is a series of conversations where I invite artists, art workers, curators, culture innovators to speak on their work that that exists between the intersection of art, technology, activism, and community. So that all came together actually based on what was lacking from my curriculum. Uh, seeing how I am being taught a just sort of traditional trajectory of art history, which is a great foundation, I've noticed that it was missing a lot of things that was happening around me. Uh, things that are happening with the Black art world, the other art world, united in, in terms of inter intersectionality and other sorts of social movements happening. Um, and I thought it would be a great idea to have that sort of almost like a reckoning, but also another form of exposure and visibility for students to have as a sort of transition and opportunities, more opportunities for them to, sorry, I'm like having a hard time like thinking at the moment, but, um, but it was like a great way for them to have access to more ideas of what they could do in the future other pathways that they can make for themselves that didn't necessarily follow, follow the traditional trajectory of a museum professional or creator, cur curator, writer, et cetera, et cetera. So having those sort of, I guess you could call it escape routes because it's not the same, it's not a traditional format. Um, it kind of shakes up the traditional format, which is pretty cool. Um, and thinking of, you know, my school, like what's the classes I'm having right now, sure, we're sort of scratching the surface of the history of racial discrimination, but I think there's so much more that can be thought through and thought of. Um, but I think a lot of the things I've noticed came from the invisibility of structural racism, uh, the things that I couldn't quite learn while in school just based on the bias of the curriculum, and maybe the bias of the teacher that I have to search for myself. Thank you so much. Uh, Kim, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, uh, thank you for having me here. Um, it's great to join all of you. And uh, in terms of my story, it's not too unlike Shamika, where for me, from the lecturer standpoint, um, I was a grad student in the MA Fashion Studies program at Parsons, gosh, about almost 10 years ago. And um, uh, a few years later, I was able to pitch an elective course uh, that I just simply called Fashion and Race. And it was my attempt, um, I guess, to serve several purposes. Um, to serve myself in a way first, where I was, um, wanting to find resources that sort of deepened um, the scholarship in our field of fashion studies, which was a nascent field to begin with. And um, so there were plenty of kind of holes in um, the curriculum and, and in what we study in terms of fashion history, fashion theory, um, the culture of fashion, all the political implications with fashion and dress and appearance and um, self-fashioning. Um, so I wanted to design a course syllabus that enabled me to start kind of cobbling together a framework for exploring the intersection of fashion and race. Um, what are the implications of the construct of race um, in terms of you know, uh, how we can historicize that to where we are today when it comes to westernized beauty standards? Um, fashion, you know, how has dress been a tool for liberation? How has it been a tool for shame? and disenfranchising groups of people, marking people, um, exploring all those things when I was putting the course together. Uh, and um, 
the, the history in art in art history and fashion history of othering certain individuals. Um, and so, uh, so just exploring all of that in various ways, it was first kind of serving myself of how can we kind of put all these pieces together? And um, also it was in service to the students who wanted, who were just, you know, going with what Shamika was saying, uh, you know, they just, they were on to this. They, they knew that they weren't getting the full story in the classroom as students. And so that fashion and race course for now for years since teaching it, I've been teaching it since 2016 has been a way to kind of answer some of those questions or help have us kind of build a sense of community um, and grapple with this history and what do we do with this? Um, and it also is in service to faculty and um, people who are not in my institution, people I've, I've gotten, I've had phone calls and received emails globally from people over the years who've said, you know, this really helped me with my dissertation, you know, the work that you're doing or my thesis. And I guess they knew about it because I also created um, in 2017, a web platform called the Fashion Race Database where I was kind of working in public, like researching and gathering these things where um, I set up a website and I just started posting all the books and articles and everything I was finding and using. So they were like, thank you for consolidating all this and finding these things. Um, so, so yeah, um, so that's kind of some of what I've been doing um, between teaching a fashion race course, creating a fashion and race database, um, which now has evolved since last year into a larger, more robust platform. And I also put on an exhibition in 2018 called Fashion and Race, Deconstructing Ideas, Reconstructing Identities, which was an attempt to engage students and creators in materializing and kind of thinking through these ideas in, in kind of the theater of an exhibition. So, um, so kind of thinking about it in these various ways, a classroom, an online platform, and an exhibition. Um, so aside from that, I also do consulting. I teach fashion history, theory, fashion, and race. And now uh, since 2019, I've been consulting fashion brands with these issues. That's amazing. You're reaching out in so many different directions. I know, Kim, you used to be at Parsons, which is a design school, and you've moved to Ryerson, which is more of a larger university. Um, and Kenoshi is obviously at Princeton, which is, you know, not focused on design um, as a university. Can you tell us a little bit about your perspective and the classes you teach and your background? Yes. Um, thank you for having me, Liz. And I was going to mention that um, teaching English and African American studies at Princeton um, is a kind of unique opportunity to discuss the art and design professions, in part because a liberal arts education doesn't typically make room for these sorts of discussions, even though I saw many of my students clamoring for this kind of engagement and education. So last year, what I did is I curated a speaker series that was public facing and that invited undergrads and grads to join in conversation around the topic of black design, which again for Princeton was relatively new. Um, there's not a lot of practical or vocational training at the university, understandably. And so this was an opportunity for students to um, think about career paths in these professions while also addressing uh, historic discrimination in them. Um, what that meant is that I essentially had to, while drawing on the work of, of colleagues on this call, I had to create my own public facing syllabus for such a course. One that would draw in people at Princeton at the same time that it made sense to anyone who's interested in these issues. Um, I invited book artist Tia Blassingame, graphic designer Jerome Harris, and furniture designer Jomo Tariku, among others, to help us talk about what it means to engage the theoretical as well as the practical stakes of addressing historic discrimination in these professions, but also pushing a way forward and, and sort of creating a space for black designers um, in ways that we haven't quite seen before. As part of that, I also drew on the History Makers Oral History Database um, in order to recover 
the stories hiding in plain sight of fashion designers, of architects, of engineers, of landscapers who have been there all along, but whose stories haven't been collected or collated in any coherent way. So that part of the series wasn't just saying who's working there now, but also who's been there and whose stories haven't really cohered under the umbrella of black design. Certainly, you know, other it, it, they've cohered under other umbrellas, let's say Detroit history or African-American labor history, but not really under design. And that was a really unique intervention that I was able to make with the help of the History Makers database. So I'm glad to be sharing my experience with you and uh, thanks for having me. It's so interesting how both you and Kim are, you know, using these digital platforms, either creating them or drawing on what's already existing. And I know that um, Jonathan also has a digital platform, but um, for now, Jonathan, can you introduce yourself? Tell us about your courses and your background um, in regard to our subject matter, and then hopefully touch a little bit on your digital project as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, I have to apologize for jumping in a bit late. Um, but hi, my name is Jonathan. I am a professor currently at FIT. I also teach at Harvard and I teach a variety of courses. Um, I teach a class on fashion and slavery, which is my primary area of research. And I also have a, a digital humanities project called Fashioning the Self in Slavery and Freedom, which lives primarily on social media. There's a Facebook page for it. It's on Instagram, uh, Twitter, YouTube, and on those platforms, I explore um, various media, articles, archival images, podcasts, videos that touch on Afro diasporic art, fashion, and visual culture. And I'm also working on a book manuscript um, tentatively titled Negro Cloth, How Slavery Birthed the Global Fashion Industry. Um, so my research, my teaching, but also my digital humanities projects touches on sort of Black visual culture broadly. Thank you so much, everyone. And one of the things I want to point out before we move on is that, you know, in doing this work, this really important work that benefits so many, you guys can't just be students, you guys can't just be professors, but you have so many other things that you have to take the initiative to kind of reach out and create, um, which really speaks to um, how much emotional labor um, goes into this work. Um, but I want to start with Shamika with a question. Um, you had said that, you know, you weren't really finding the topics being discussed in your curriculum. And so that's why you kind of created your own platforms. But have um, regarding design history um, in your classes, other class design history classes, or other classes you've taken, have they ever come up issues of race or racial discrimination um, related specifically to design or just in general? And if they did, how do you think your professors and classmates handled this topic? I think, well, basic, based on my own curriculum, I haven't taken enough design courses. A lot of the things I've learned about design happen on my own time. Mm -hmm. There was one course I've taken on the Bauhaus, but um, since it was specific to you know, the Bauhaus and German history, I don't think there was an emphasis on race and design in that form, um, which is totally valid. Um, but I think in general, I've heard, um, like, I don't want to say complaints, but I heard feedback from other students how certain things tend to be framed in sort of a white narrative, like a white historical narrative. Um, and there wasn't enough emphasis on black design. So I feel incomplete <laughs> in terms of answering this question because my experience hasn't been complete in that way. But I think there's so much that can be done. Um, I may not have the story or the answers, but I know other people may have. And I think even just that um, kind of lack that you've experienced so far speaks volumes. Um, so I want to turn to um, our other three panelists as professors um, and thinking about your own education and training. So I'm thinking undergrad, masters, at through your PhDs, um, were there any models um, from professors, from certain classes, from even lesson plans that stood out to you um, about teaching and learning about racial dynamics, um, even if it was just through example, um, in relation to the design profess um, professions? Um, and did these experiences inform how you now teach? 
um, whoever would like to jump in first. Don't make me pick. I will pick one of you. <laughs> uh, Kenoshi, why don't we start with you? Are there any experiences that you remember from like your education and your training that um, inform the way you handle teaching, thinking about race and conveying that to your students? I didn't have any firsthand experience with this for the reasons that I outlined uh, earlier about the challenges of teaching and indeed coming through a liberal arts education. Um, very little hands on work um, that are, that it, that's nonetheless theoretical and critical in its own right. But I will say that the experience of curating my series um, and really de facto graduate course black design got me thinking creatively of different modes of assessment i could take to all of my classes not just um ones focused on design so prior to the pandemic i had hoped to assign a zine making project for a spring course and i would not have conceived of that had i not spent over a year curating this this seminar. Um, but the plan was not simply to say, well, I'm going to provide you the materials and this is how zines relate to the particular topic under consideration, in this case, Black and Asian relations in America. Um, but I was actually going to invite uh, Philadelphia-based um, zine collective um, to come to campus and to lead a workshop, because that's where, in fact, the theoretical and hands-on work happens, is through practice, through experience, and through hands-on making. Um, now, needless to say, the pandemic scuttled that plan, but the, the, the modes of assessment that I set forth for myself in spring 2020 were much more hands-on than I've ever sort of imagined before. And I trace that directly to wanting to bring more of design and vocational thinking into a classically liberal arts education. That's really interesting. And I just want to follow up quickly and um, ask about what was the reception of that at um, Princeton, um, adding more kind of hands-on um, even design history into such a traditional kind of academic environment? Well, I fortunately um, had a program that was fully supportive of curriculum innovation, and that was American Studies. So I actually offer the course not in one of my joint appointed departments, but in a program that I teach for occasionally. And American Studies was very receptive to this experimental approach. In addition to the zine making project, um, again, I had this all lined up and unfortunately this fell pretty much right when things um, closed down for good mid-March. Um, I had a cooking class with oh. Afro-Asian Caribbean, uh, a professional Afro-Asian Caribbean chef from New York who's going to come to Princeton, lead a cooking class, cooking demonstration, talking about how Jamaica has incredibly complex cross-cultural foodways. And then the students would then create their own recipes based on that demonstration. So I, I really did have this all planned out and American Studies was very receptive to it. That, that sounds like a class I'd love to take. I'm sorry, Shanika, go ahead. I just want to say real quick, that could still happen, but it could just be like a digital thing because I kind of want to take that class. <laughs> that sounds so interesting. So Kim and Jonathan, is there anything that you can kind of point back to in your education that inspired or informed, even if it was like a negative example that you kind of rebel against um, in the way that you teach these um, sensitive topics, um, incorporate them into your curriculum? I have to say, I learned more from my peers and from my students than actually from my professors. So I'm thinking about my undergraduate career and even like my graduate experience. In terms of like teaching and facilitating conversations about like race, it was more so from my friends, from my classmates, 
and also from my students. Like it was, and I'll often tell my students this, you know, you often think that you have to sort of foster connections with your superiors. And of course that's really important, but also what's really important is sort of the, the lateral connections that you make. Cause I was able to learn more so from my peers and my colleagues and also from my students um, and sort of like listening to things that they're saying and things that are important to them than from necessarily my dissertation, you know, advisor or my professors. So um, it was more so being more attuned to like the conversations that were around me on a horizontal level than more so on a vertical level. That's a really interesting point and a really interesting point to convey to your students as well and how they can kind of um, supplement or, you know, enhance their education and their discussions. Uh, Kim, how about you? Is there anything um, in your educational background that helped inform your teaching? Yeah, uh, my story, it, it, it's kind of backwards. It, um, about 20 years ago, I went to uh, an HBCU for a little over a year. And so I actually had a very diverse education after attending kind of this white affluent college prep school in Texas. And then I went over to an HBCU on the East Coast in Virginia. And um, I was just exposed. I was like, I just went from one world into another and it was just like all black everything and just black professors all of a sudden. And sorority and fraternity life and all the cultural uh, uh, richness that comes with that. Um, so I was surrounded by different diverse forms of food, music, speaking. Um, and so it really opened up my mind. And so as someone who likes to rebel from time to time, I had um, quickly kind of linked up with this collective of classmates. We all kind of joined at the same time and we started we, we all had um, kind of this affinity for writing poetry and I used to write poetry. And so we would do poetry slams. This is very like 20 years ago, neo soul era. Um, but um, we would speak at poetry slams and we were considered very rebellious, um, not in like this violent way, but we, um, our ideas were very radical. It was about knowledge of self, self-determination, um, and just kind of speaking the truth about our black culture and, you know, being at an HBCU that oddly enough, you know, that wasn't always welcome, you know, because there's just so many different kind of politics amongst black people in these spaces. We're not, we're not um, a monolith. So we were considered very radical to even think of these ideas of wearing our hair naturally proudly. We were putting on a protest for um, Amadou Diallo. I still have the armband that I created for it. And because um, he was shot, I think, 21 times by the New York Police Department. And so we were really radical in that way. And the school would not let us be a um, full student organization. And after we all kind of left, it became an official student organization. But like it was just so we were really into collecting and organizing, protesting, speaking out. Um, and that always stayed with me. I was forever changed after that. So I moved back to Texas. And that was in my mind of, I want to learn things completely differently. I've, I've seen too much. I've heard too much now. Now I, you can't put that back in the bottle. And so when I went back to Texas, I spent a few years thinking and I didn't graduate from that school. I just, it, it left me with a lot to think about. And I was kind of going through this existential crisis. And um, I ended up going back to school a couple of years later and studying anthropology and art history. And so um, I was very much interested in culture and ethnicity and um, thinking about where, you know, where, what direction I can take this in. And so then a few years after that, you know, I, I, during my time in undergrad, I had a professor, art history professor said, you really need to go to grad school. Like, I think you've got, you're very active. You've got a lot going on. Like, I think you'd be a really great grad student. So, um, I picked a school and just one school um, that really resonated with me spiritually. And that was the new school because they do dip things differently. And they're very supportive of these kinds of attitudes and ideas. And so I enrolled and uh, I got in. And so I joined the fashion studies program, which I was in the second cohort. Um, so it was brand new, um, but it was great. And, you know, from being a student there to being um, a lecturer after graduation, um, it was very kind of similar to what um, Kanoe is saying is 
Um, I, I had the privilege of being supported 100% of the way um, when I was a student, my program supported me um, when I was pitching a course, my um, department supported me when I pitched an exhibition, they came through for me. Um, and they, they supported me all the way into my last semester at the new school when I moved on to Ryerson. So, um, all of that, as I say, it, it's kind of also like what Jonathan was saying, a lot of that education not only came from my time at the HBCU from the professors, but, um, especially from my peers, all the things that we were thinking through as a collective, um, that really kind of, um, shaped my outlook and the way I approach things and. So, um, I'm not a huge fan of too much rigidity or structures and things like that. I, I feel like everything is kind of plastic and can be molded or questioned or pushed back on. So, um, and that is the way I lead my life professionally right now. It's just sort of, I create spaces where I don't see it. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. So it seems like all of you are coming, even Shamika, like at this point are coming from educational institutions that are perhaps not quite, um, didn't necessarily have those structures in place, but even as a student, but especially as professors, you guys are creating those. And it seems like these institutions are open um, to these new ideas, these new structures when it comes to tackling issues of race. Um, so I wanna ask you guys about any specific lesson plans that you use to um, kind of convey these ideas or draw your students out to discuss them. Um, Kenoshi was talking about all the great kind of multimedia things that he's doing, if you'd like to add anything else, but what specific lesson plans do you do to teach on racial dynamics and what resources and strategies do you kind of draw on to help convey these topics, which can be very sensitive. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's hard to get students to speak. And so Shamika, I'd also love to hear about the strategies you use in your own kind of um, organizing and your own um, organization organization. So should I go first? <laughs> um, from a student point of view, I think I would rather appreciate more socialist ideals incorporated into the curriculum. Um, just thinking about people like June Jordan, uh, Thomas Sankara, uh, Linda Good Bryant, even who, you know, she came from an art history background and she started jam her gallery just above Midtown and then led on to create Project Eats, which is now uh, a co food collective to help with in food insecurity and sustainability. So just learning about different people like that, I feel can be a great way to, you know, have people see themselves in the world and in the stake of world building, coming together and nurturing a more restorative society. I think the way we're taught and the way teachers are taught to teach uh, is based on this sort of individualistic mode of living and producing and being when we are all so deeply connected that we should think of ourselves more as a rhizome and less as a sort of like individual nomad or leader. Um, and I think that's what should be done for our curriculum um, in terms of teaching and working together, um, in terms of thinking and building and rebuilding. That is really interesting and insightful. Um, Kim, Jonathan, Kenoshi, can you talk any about any specific lesson plans that you use? And Kenoshi, I mean, you already gave us some really great examples. Is there anything you want to add or do you want to kick it to our other professors? What I can add is a lesson plan centered on the oral history database that I cited earlier. At first, um, I was really just trying to get a sense of who is out there, um, who's done work in fashion design, in graphic design that we don't really know about and that this database might have an account of. Um, now, what's great about history makers is that all interviews have been transcribed and the text is searchable. So at first I, you know, search for th things like graphic design and that maybe got me, you know, to a couple of figures I had never known before. But then I realized that once I pulled on that thread, regionally and professionally, the, the better search terms actually revealed a pipeline 
of black design that has at this uh, up until this point has remained relatively invisible because what I saw was a cluster of designers across all professions coming from, for example, Detroit's Cass Technical High School. And so rather than individually to, to kind of riff on Shamika here, searching for who is an accomplished landscaper, who is an accomplished fashion designer, I just looked at Cass Technical High School and before me, you know, there arose maybe 50 plus professional designers um, across fields who all came through this pipeline that if you're from Detroit, you know, but if you're not from Detroit, you wouldn't necessarily know to pick out. And I just wonder how many of those pipelines have existed for decades um, that we haven't even really begun to um, see or recognize because they're predominantly black, because they're public schools, and yet they've defied the odds and created some of the most brilliant design minds of the 20th and 21st centuries. So thinking critically about our search terms, what we're looking for um, isn't necessarily going to take us to standard categories, but actually existing on the ground, black horizontal relationships um, that have existed for decades, and we just need to do a better job of seeking them out. That's a great point. I know Tracy Reese went to Cass uh, Technical uh, High School. Uh, Jonathan and Kim, can you talk about some specific lesson plans that you found particularly uh, uh, useful or um, effective? Absolutely. I mean, I like Professor Nishikawa and Professor Jenkins. I'm a big fan of digital methodologies. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I have a digital humanities project, Fashioning the Self and Slavery and Freedom where I just post a lot of media that's related to the connection between histories of enslavement and the fashion system. And often people's reaction when they see, when they learn about the project is like, how are you finding all these amazing resources? This is crazy. Like, how are you digging up all this information? But I'm using resources that we all have access to, whether it's the Met's website or the Library of Congress. I'm just reading those materials in different ways. And that's something that I incorporate into my classroom. Like I often have my students sort of use social media and digital databases um, in the classroom. And it's something, most of these resources are actually free and open to the public. So for example, one lesson plan that I incorporate into my class is there are a number of amazing databases of runaway slave ads that you know, it's great now in the pandemic because it's an exercise that you can easily sort of sort of transfer to virtual teaching. And so I have them sort of comb these databases of runaway slave ads to look at how the dress of enslaved people is described and the clothing that they took with them when they ran away. Another really great database or source is the WPA narratives, which are digital digitized um, transcriptions of interviews by formerly enslaved people um, that's now digitized on the Library of Congress's website. Again, free, open to the public, um, and also it's keyword searchable. Um, so you can look for keywords. Um, so those are two sort of lesson plans that I often incorporate into my pedagogy. I love with these three examples with history makers, with WPA, with uh... Um, runaway slave ads is that they have been used by his, a certain set of historians for a long time for a specific thing, but we can repurpose them and find new information about fashion, about design, about other things. Um, so it's like endlessly giving and they're out here for us. Kim, can you talk to us a little bit about some of your lesson plans? Yes, uh, lesson plans and, and ways of thinking. Um, I uh, Just to piggyback on what Jonathan's saying, um, absolutely, there's so many resources online that I can build a, a classroom activity off of um, back in more physical interactive times uh, at Parsons. Uh, an ongoing project we would do is take a field trip to the uh, new school library. And uh, in our in our libraries, we had all the archives of Vogue magazine and Harper's Bazaar magazine, and we would do an image analysis where um, the students just kind of got to run out and just pull you know, pull a Vogue from 1987, pull a Vogue from 1927. 
and pick an image, you know, whether it's a cover or an editorial spread, and they are assigned to unpack that image. And I would write up a worksheet. I design a worksheet with different prompts of like, um, in terms of positioning of the bodies, you know, what are we seeing here? Is the would you consider this an empowering image or disempowering image? Is it a diverse image? Um, is there any diversity in this issue? Um, why are you know who are the personnel? Who are the stylists on this team? Makeup artists? Can you identify them? The photographer? Um, we look, we read into it, and also just like the composition of the image and and unpack it together. Of, you know, is this playing on stereotypes or fetish? And um, so that so that's one exercise we do. Um, another lesson plan, um, and this kind of draws on an a, an adjacent field of fashion law is um, in the last couple of years of teaching fashion and race, I created a worksheet for um, cultural appropriation or misappropriation. So they have all these prompts, this worksheet to go off of, and we would present a case, you know, this image of um, cultural appropriation and seeing if it is indeed cultural appropriation or not. And so on one semester in 2019, I brought in my friend and colleague, Ariel um, Alaya, um, of FIT and, and now at the Fashion Law Institute. And so she would kind of weigh in, let the students kind of read into it and what their verdict was. And then she, with her fashion law background, would let them know, well, technically it's not, you know, misappropriation. Um, and so those are some of the activities we would do. Theoretically speaking, and in terms of organizing, um, I get a lot of my ideas um, from the food community uh, in the last, Midway into me living in New York, uh, maybe from 2016 or so, um, I made I, I I made a dear friend out of my uh, out of Kim Chow who um, was running the food book fair in New York, and then um, she has since gone into organizing formerly at Allied Media projects, and now um, she has a project that is actually sponsored by Allied Media projects in Detroit, um, over in New York called FIG, Food Issues Group. And so I have learned so much through my friendship with her. She's brought me to events with her food community and organizing and learning how they think through food in terms of labor, culture production, um, and, and just identity, identity construction through food. Um, and so, um, so they've been doing some really exciting work at Food Issues Group where they're bringing food to underserved communities. and. So um, between attending food book fair with her and other events that they put on, I borrow also some of my ideas about how can I use some of you know their manifesto in the work I'm doing now at the Fashion Race database and what I'm doing with my team. I have a team working at the Fashion Race database and trying to um, see you know what 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 can we um, what kind of best practices can we draw upon from. Um, our sister industry, the food industry, with the, the organizing that they're doing, especially when it comes to labor organizing. Um, there's so much that uh, people in the food community are, you know, steps ahead in doing. Um, you know, a lot of what we borrowed, some of our language with fast fashion and slow fashion has come from slow food and fast food. So, um, so I, I look to the food industry for also cues and, and best practices on how to uh, build a better uh, fashion system and convey that to the students. I really love that both you and Kenoshi are looking to this other industry that does seem to be a little bit ahead of the fashion industry. Um, you gave that example with um, sustainability, but also with um, kind of um, multiculturalism and tackling racial dynamics. Um, I think that's such a great strategy, looking at all these, what we wouldn't consider fashion or design sources, but borrowing kind of the best of what they're doing and putting it to practical use. So the next question I wanna ask all of you is about kind of the emotional atmosphere that's created by these conversations and these discussions, not just with your students, but all of us are people of color. And, you know, we also take an emotional toll when we have to teach and constantly think about this. So, Shamika, in your own um, kind of lack of education and then your own um, organizing and bringing people together, but also our professors and how are your students emotionally react in this and how does how do you emotionally react? Um, I think. Given the toll of the past year, there's a sort of new expectation of people of color to be the sort of all-encompassing person of answers. Well, 
they well although we do have answers but we don't have all the answers right nor do we have the power to enforce uh actual strategies of solutions and not that i think that it should only be on us it's more of like a collective thing as i was talking about the act of self-determination is an act of self-determination for all people um and thinking about what you know that even means in terms of my practice with on the ground um, and not knowing all the answers, that platform, just as, just as much as it was a place for students to search and figure out like what they might wanna do, it was definitely a place for me to figure out what I wanted to, uh, who I want to be, uh, what kind of values I want to have in store for myself so I could go on in the future. Um, and what does it even mean, the future, right? I think there's so many things happening in the now that feels so heavy and chaotic that it's almost, the future seems almost like perishable, although the, although there is a future, I'm sure. Um, but I think a lot of it just comes down to working together, um, trying to design a better future for everyone, um, not just for those in power or those of a ruling class. Thank you. Um, for our professors, can we talk a little bit about the emotional toll of both your students and yourselves? I can speak to that. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, just also, um, Shamika brings up a good point, you know, it, you know, before we can focus on the future, it all depends on the present and, and what we're doing with the present moment right now. And, um, I think in terms of the emotional toll, uh, I was kind of naive going into this several years ago in, in first launching the fashion and race course at Parsons and no, underestimating rather um, the emotional toll it would take on me and especially the students and things that can have a triggering effect uh, for students. Um, and also in having a diverse classroom, um, for instance, in fashion and race, um, you're going to have some students who are dealing with oppression in ways that other students are not. And so you have some students in the classroom who, you know, just they're kind of listening and learning in the class. And then you've got black students in the class who are just over it and just don't, you know, aren't ready to go into certain conversations or don't feel comfortable talking about it in front of their white classmates in fashion and race. Um, thankfully, each year I had. A, a very respectful group of diverse students, students who did not live through, were, uh, did not have a black lived experience. And so they just were like, I'm just going to be quiet. I'm just going to listen. I'm not going to jump in. I'm not going to add my opinion or anything like that or ask inappropriate questions. Um, but, you know, for instance, there was one, uh, one time in the class a few years ago um, where a student um, who was not black uh, and she was South American. But um, she felt that slavery goes on today um, in various ways, which is arguable. I mean, you could say like in various countries, there is slavery going on, um, but she saw that as kind of an extension of black slavery of like, it's no different. And one black student got very enraged and said, it's very different. You can't just put them on the same level. Um, and, you know, it, it, it tears were shed, you know, it just ended up being a very tense moment that we had to diffuse. Um, because the student was just, you know, one, you have one student just conflating the two and just saying, well, we should be just as angry about slavery today. It's the same thing as your people. And so, um, so that, you know, there were tense moments from time to time. Um, but, um, I think for me also putting together a class like that, teaching it and, um, becoming more known for it, you have colleagues or people from all over just wanting to pick your brain and talk about it. And that is very exhausting for me to do. Um, people often don't realize, you know, just how laborious it can be just to ask if, you know, you can sit down for a meeting and can you give me tips or pointers or, you know, uh, anything like that. So, um, you know, I, you know, now here in April 2021, I am kind of hitting a point of exhaustion um, because my work also then turned into consulting work. And when you're working with companies, that want you and want to talk, you know, they want you to en enlighten them on fashion and race. And then they have this kind of take it or leave it attitude of, well, we'll see if this fits our bottom line or let's just do this. Or this is like a, a, a 
checkbox that we're taking right now for our diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, it's very frustrating because there's so many structural things that you're seeing not change within these companies. And so you're coming in just to give a talk and then, you know, um, that, that this is just kind of another part of the process. So it, it is frustrating. I wrestle with it of like, am I, you know, making a difference with these companies? Should I even bother? Um, you know, some, so many of these structural issues continue to exist. So, um, it, when all of that falls on a person of color and by the way, this is the last thing I was like, I also, in my experience of being kind of inside the fashion industry and working with them, uh, for over about a year and a half, oftentimes you see people of color, especially women, um, doing all of the work of these diversity and inclusion efforts. And since I've been in that space now, it is exhausting and frustrating to see that that hierarchy still exists where it's kind of like you've got these white leaders and then it's, you know, then thrown onto the plate of um, racialized women to do the thing, you know, let, we're going to have you lead um, our diversity and inclusion efforts right now. And so, you know, I just don't see a whole lot changing. Um, so it's, it's frustrating, especially when you experience it firsthand. It's one thing for people to talk about it in comments on social media, but to actually witness it yourself and be in on that and see sometimes kind of a flakiness with dealing with these issues in the industry um, and, and not seeing enough change also in various curricula in institutions, um, it's, it's, yeah, it, it's exhausting, mentally exhausting. I just want to like quickly interject real quick. Sorry, Jonathan. No, please. Um, but just to follow up to what Kim was saying that, you know, this is a constant problem that we have to keep like talking on and speaking on. Um, it's just that we have the answers. It's all out there. The resources out there, the people are out there. It's just that people have to be comfortable with losing the things that they've accumulated in their mind to be valuable under a capitalist society. So I think, you know, if we're talking about structural racism and trying to, you know, reimagine that and like kind of use abolitionists at the same time, that means, you know, taking from the top and, you know, giving it to everyone on like a vertical chain, a horizontal chain. And some people are just not comfortable with that. Um, and I just wanted to put that out there that, you know, until we, you know, stop putting profit over people then we're going to keep having these conversations. Thank just you. Just to respond to that real quick too, is just sort of, um, you're absolutely right. And I've, I've mentioned that from time to time is that the thing is, and I think why we're not going to see a whole lot of momentum is because from whether it's an academic institution or in a business to make these necessary changes, someone's going to have to get out of their seat, give up their seat, pass it on to someone else, or, you know, make some sort of, change and you have a lot of people who don't want to do that and all of this batting around of the problem or trying to go through these different processes of thinking through and let's put a working group together or let's put a you know task force you know it just buys time in just not really getting down to what really needs to happen which could be which really does necessitate a radical change and people just do not feel comfortable with having to get to that point. No one wants to like give up their seat for someone else to, you know, do something or even change some of those hierarchies or completely change their curriculum. Um, because then you've got also in the academic space, educators then have to rethink their syllabus or learn things that, you know, if they believed one narrative for 20, 30 years that they've been teaching, they're gonna have to rethink that. And that's incredibly inconvenient. Thank you both, because I mean, throughout this panel, all of you have given like concrete examples of what people can do, um, you know, databases they can go to, specific lesson plans. So thank you all for the emotional work that you guys are putting in and also giving people these tips. So I hope everyone's listening and they don't necessarily have to go back to you and ask you in person for, you know, to pick your brain. But I wanna, if with Jonathan and Konoshi, does kind of this Ivy League kind of, um, Umbrella change add a layer to the emotional toll of your students and yourselves. Can you speak to that? Or maybe it doesn't, but uh, put that out there. Absolutely. I mean, this is a really important question. This question could easily be the entire panel. Us unpacking all these issues. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I absolutely like I've never taught at a HBCU. I've always both been educated and taught at sort of elite, predominantly white institutions. And so, like, my courses have become sort of safe spaces and almost like therapy sessions for students um, because often they haven't had another space where they feel comfortable sort of hashing out these issues. Um, and so I often ask my, you know, my students, you know, have you ever had a black professor before? Have you ever had, you know, a queer black professor before? And more often than not, the question is, no, like, you're my first black professor. You're my first queer black professor. Like, this is the first time I felt comfortable sort of talking about this, not as sort of like with friends or, you know, with a therapist. Um, so, you know, I often have to like, give space to have conversations that aren't necessarily grounded in the readings, <laughs> but grounded more so in experience. But that's okay, um, because I think that's important. I feel like it's my role as an educator to sort of give space to those kind of conversations. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think this is, this is really important um, because it's kind of central to what we're all doing at the moment. And just to add to that, one of the things that I've appreciated about working across fields with designers is that I've become a sharper thinker of infrastructure and the embedded kind of work it's going to take to overturn um, regimes of power and profit making. Um, it's it it. You know, in many ways, designers are the behind the scenes actors who really see the guts of the system and entering into this field has been incredibly clarifying for me on that count. Now, what does that mean? Moving forward, I am not limiting my vision to the institution or to calls for inclusion with the institution. I think one of the great things about left and black radical critiques of liberal responses to this summer's racial reckoning is that, um, you know, anti-racist reading lists will just feed into the power structure, especially when, as Kim was uh, suggesting, the goal is really to just, in fact, make corporate demands more palatable and to make this machine run more efficiently. Um, there's a reason why most of these books are targeted toward corporate workshops and, and corporate funding. Um, and that's been a black radical and left critique from the very beginning. Extrapolating from that, I think actual equity demands the kind of rethinking of institutions around self-determination that Shamika was pointing to. And I want to share with the group something that while it was founded before the summer of 2020 um, has really gained momentum over the past nine months, and that is Tia Blassingame's um, book print artist scholar, scholar of Color Collective, which she invited me to join. I'll put that here in the chat so that you get a sense of the kind of extra institutional work it's going to take for people of color to really rethink infrastructure from the bottom up. Right, not sort of taking as a given the institutions we want to be part of, but rather reimagining institutions around what we want and what we want to fight for and what matters to us. Um, so even though the emotions have been raw and the conversations have been incredibly taxing, especially when you're dealing with white people who really have no interest in what you have to say, this has also been a moment of solidarity building and, and sort of um, coming together and sort of saying, what's the world we want to build? Um, and I haven't, I've actually never lived through a moment like this in my own life, but when I, I'm a scholar of the Black Arts Movement, when I read in that era, I see a lot of that same energy happening now. I think these are really important points because as design students, um, you know, you can think about your own practice in a very individual way, but, you know, eventually you have to go out and get a job. You have to join a, perhaps a corporate structure. And these are all things that um, hopefully students are keeping in mind. 
So we only have three minutes left, but we have a couple of questions. Um, so I'm going to, the first question is for Kim and Jonathan. So if you guys just have a couple of words you want to speak to this. Um, as you did some consulting or gave lectures in Europe, did you find that it was harder to approach topics of race and discrimination there than in America? And if so, how can um, we bridge this gap with um, non-Anglophile fashion academia? Uh, that's, if you guys have just a couple of words, I want to get you guys out at 1130 so we can go to the breakout room. Um, but if there's anything you can speak to that. Um, just, just a real quick, I don't know if I can speak to the, uh, the bridging quickly enough, but, um, uh, yes, it, it's very different when you're working in, uh, some of these spaces. Um, I, uh, like working in Europe or with luxury brands, um, the word race is a very harsh word, um, I've been told. And so I, I was just slinging it all around as I was like doing some education work over there and they prefer ethnicity. I'm sure there's arguments that can be had of that, you know, um, but um race definitely has sort of a different connotation so we have to be kind of also cognizant of the words we use um and also in my experience in hong kong with gucci um in 2019 uh you know it, it's kind of more of a homogenous culture so i think as a black woman being the only black person in an entire corporate space um it uh it, I'm, i was just with all like east asian folks in italian the whole Italian group all there. And so it was, yeah, it, it's very different trying to like talk about these really kind of deep seated issues and, and black identity um, when that is not at the end of the day after I like hop back on my airplane and go back to New York, um, something that they really get or feel like inspired to fight for. So, so yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, there's, there's so much more to add to that, but um, it's it's definitely language is an issue and just sort of getting it to resonate over there is is difficult in various spaces. Yeah. Yeah, and just to piggyback off of what Kim said, that you just have to be attuned to like localized forms of racial formations. Um, you know, race is a social construct. Oops. Sorry, <laughs> my phone's going off. Um, <laughs> But yeah, you have to be attuned to um, how race functions in different localities um, and um, pay attention to that. Um, and I'm not, I'm not used to thinking about race so much in Europe or in Asia, but hemispherically thinking about different racial formations in like Latin America as opposed to the United States. Um, so, you know, just be careful about how you're using different racial terminologies and be sort of attuned to local localized versions of race. I want to thank all of you so much for joining my, the panel today and um, being here with me. Um, I'm just going to read the last question really quickly in case anyone wants to think about it or discuss it in the breakout room from Faith. Um, many academics categorize non-Western garments as ethnic or traditional dress. I was wondering why you think the term fashion is often only associated with Eurocentric systems, which is a very kind of potent idea in fashion studies, especially right now. So perhaps something to think about or discuss um, at a later time. But thank you guys so much um, for being with us today and sharing all of your insights and also the these very specific tips and sources for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.